Welcome to the live Bible study hosted by Andrew Womack Ministries and Karis Bible College. Tonight, you'll learn truths from the Word with believers around the globe. Submit any questions you have in the comments and share this broadcast tonight with your friends. Welcome to our Tuesday night live Bible study. We are glad that you've joined us and we've got people already from all over the world, all over the United States. And just like last week and then next week on Tuesday night, we are also broadcasting on GEB Network, which they have a potential of 35 million uh, households that watch that. So we've got it on all of these social platforms. We've got it on our website. And the reason we call it a live Bible study is because we are broadcasting live and you can interact with us and we would like you to respond and give us questions. And uh, because we're on GEB, this is going to go from 6 till 7 Mountain Time. That'll be 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock uh, Eastern Time. And we are going to go a full hour and we will take about 30 minutes and I'm going to do a Bible study. This is really going to be good. You are going to be blessed and challenged uh, tonight. I'd never heard anybody teach these things the first time I've taught it. Now, I've heard other people since then, but I mean, it's not, it's not common. These are some things that will really bless you. But we will spend about 30 minutes and then we'll answer questions and it's going to be a great time. So this is Karen Conrad with me. She's our host tonight. She's a blessing. She's I don't know what you do, but you do just about everything in this ministry. You're over marketing, yes. promotions. What is your official title? Director of Marketing. Okay, I was close. <laughs> and anyway, she's a blessing. And so Karen's going to give you all of the details about how you can get involved. And she understands this social media stuff, which I don't. So she, this is Karen Conrad. She'll give you that information. Then I'll come back. We're going to have a great Bible study. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you joined us tonight. And we do have people from all over the world. Belgium, Argentina, Nigeria, Indonesia. Wow, welcome. We're so glad that you joined us. So as Andrew mentioned, we want you to send in your questions and you can do that several ways. You can send questions in on Facebook or live chat and they can text them in tonight, Andrew. That's a new feature. And you can send your questions to 954-800-AWMI. We also have the Bible study notes that are available to you. And so we want you to sign up for those and you'll get the notes from tonight. And every week you'll receive an email with that information. I've got seven pages of notes here and I can promise you that I am not going to be able to cover seven pages in 30 minutes. So there's a lot more detail than what I'll be able to give. And these notes would really help you. So I encourage yes. you to get them. And to get those notes, go to awmi.net slash Bible study. And we also do a giveaway and that's how you get entered into the drawing is to sign up for those Bible study notes. And so last week we gave away your new Proverbs book and the winner is Cindy Exum. Congratulations to Cindy. And tonight, Andrew, we're giving away a very special ornament. Yeah, that Proverbs book was an 812 page book. It's the first time I've ever done anything like this. And this is an ornament that my son made. He does things like this for a living. I've signed it on the back. And the unique thing about this is this is the son that was dead for five hours. Mm -hmm. And in a morgue, stripped naked with a toe tag on. Oh, you don't goodness. get mi very many Christmas decorations <laughs> that were made by somebody who'd been dead for five hours. So this is quite a conversation piece. It if people is. see it, you can start talking to them about that. So Amen. that'd be great. And it's, it's really beautiful. So again, to uh, qualify for that, sign up for the Bible study notes at awmi.net slash Bible study. So Andrew, we are so excited for your teaching tonight. Well, let me also say that we have people waiting in our phones right now. They are in another room in this building and we have, I don't know, 40 or 50 people and we can accommodate your calls. And so if something I say, uh, you know, piques your interest or something, you say, couldn't be. Have you got any more teaching on that? They know all of the teaching. They've got a computer screen that if you were to mention a certain scripture, all I have to do is type in that verse and it'll bring up every book, every CD, every DVD, 
anything where I ever mention this. If I talk about a story tonight, they can type in that story and it'll bring everything up. So anyway, if you wanted any more information, you can call and get that. You can talk with someone, have yes. them pray with you. You can ask questions. You can give uh, if you'd like to help us continue to do this. We've been doing these live Bible studies for what? A little over... About a year. I think it's been a little over a year. A Didn't we start over. in November and... We did. We tested it for about a month and then yeah. we decided so to go forward. Yeah. And anyway, it's awesome. So I'd encourage you to be a part. You got Amen. anything else? I was just going to let people know that, um, Andrew, with your teachings too, when people do have a question on a topic, you have all of your teachings on the website completely free of charge for people. And yeah, that is such a blessing. We've got nearly 400, I think, 300, just yes. under 400 of my teachings are all available free. We've got... Um, I think it's 17 years worth of my television broadcast are yes. all archive free. Mm -hmm. And I've got more than that, maybe 16 or, or 20 years or something worth of radio programs and just a lot of stuff. So man, uh, <laughs> we could keep you busy for over a year <laughs> just downloading free stuff. And so please check it out, awmi.net. It's a blessing. That it? That's it, Andrew. All right, so what I wanna share with you, let me just give a little background on this last week uh, because we're going to be on the GEB network for three weeks in a row, I'm kind of teaching in a sequence here. And last week I started sharing about I had a miraculous encounter with the Lord on March the 23rd, 1968. And basically what the Lord showed me was that uh, I was a new person. He gave me a new identity. I was trying to relate to God based on my performance, and He showed me that it's in Christ that I'm brand new. And I use 2 Corinthians 5, 17, which says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things are become new. And God gave me a revelation that that wasn't true about my body. My body didn't instantly change. You know, when you get saved, you're still gonna be a man, you're still gonna be a woman, you're still gonna be fat, you're still gonna be <laughs> tall or short or whatever. Your body doesn't change, it's going to change in the future, but right now we still have the same body. Your soul hasn't changed, your mental, emotional part of you is still the same, but in the spirit, you are a completely brand new person. And so last week, again, I'm just trying to say this very quickly, you can get materials if you call that number, 719-635-1111, uh, you can get all of the materials that I have on spirit, soul, and body, and things like that. I'll, I got a lot of teaching on this. But I shared last week how that it says, First uh, John chapter 4, verse 17, as he is, so are we in this world. Not so are we going to be in the next, so are we right now. That's not true of your body. It's not true of your emotions your mental part, but it is true in the spirit realm. You are a completely brand new person. So basically, that's what I spent nearly uh, 30 minutes last week sharing was about how that when you get born again, the change takes place in your spirit. Your spirit is completely brand new. And the rest of the Christian life is learning how to walk in the spirit, how to let your who you are in Christ dominate you instead of what you feel and see in your body. Mm -hmm. But now this brings some questions. If people accept what I said, that as Jesus says, so are you in this world and many other scriptures that I use. I've had people come to me before, Karen, and they'll say, well, yeah, I got born again and I, I believe that I was saved, but I've blown it. You don't understand. I went back into sin. I've done something. And it doesn't have to be a major deal, but all of us are just constantly falling short of what we are supposed to be. And if you only think that you were forgiven up until the time that you were born again, and then every time you mm -hmm. sin, you lose that and you have to get saved again. Or, oh you know, it's, it's like uh, if you had a stick, if this was a stick, there's two ends to a stick. They're opposite, but it's really the same stick. There are some people that believe that every time you sin, you lose your salvation. And if you were to die before you got that sin confessed, you would go to hell. Then a lesser interpretation, but it's the same principle, is that no, you don't go to hell, but you lose all your benefits. God won't fellowship with you. He won't use you. You won't have joy and peace. It's the, it's the exact same thing with just lesser consequences. And that is not true. The truth is that when you got born again, God forgave you of all sin. Not only the sin you had committed before you made Jesus your Lord, but the sins you haven't even committed yet. 
And you know what? The first time I ever thought that, because I was studying Scripture, I thought, oh, God, this can't be right. <laughs> I mean, this was contrary to everything I've been taught. It's probably contrary to most of what mm -hmm. you've been taught. But what I want to do is share Scripture with you tonight and show this to you from the Word. First of all, Romans chapter 4, verse 7. And I wish I had time to put this in its context, but Paul was talking about how even Abraham and David were justified in the sight of God, not by their good works, but by putting faith in God's grace. And he used as an example, he quoted from David, and this is a quotation from Psalms chapter 32. But here's what it says in Romans chapter 4, verse 7. It says, he's quoting David saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. And then verse 8, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And you know, some people miss this, but this is significant. It didn't say, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not or did not, but it says, to whom the Lord will not wow. impute That's sin. Awesome. This is nearly too good to be true. Sounds like the gospel. That's what the word gospel <laughs> means, does. too good to be true. And this is what was prophesied. Even David from Psalms chapter uh, 30. Two verses one and two, let me just read those to you. It says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. Even in Psalms chapter 32, it even makes it clear that this is talking about in your spirit, man. Sin affects your body. Even if you're a Christian, sin still has consequences. If you take what I'm saying, and say, well, man, this is wonderful. I think I'll go rob a bank because I, God's not going to hold sin against me. You know, it's absolutely true. If you were truly born again, God forgave you of that sin of robbing a bank before you did it. But does that mean you go out and rob a bank? Well, if you do, you can have a wonderful relationship with God while you're sitting in your prison cell amen. rotting for years, amen. <laughs> God will love you and He is not going to impute it to you, but there are still consequences to that sin. And this makes it very clear. It says, blessed is, to the man, blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. It makes it clear that it's your spirit that gets changed. And David wasn't talking about his day because in his day, people weren't born again and their spirits weren't changed. This was a prophecy of the New Testament and that's the reason that the Apostle Paul quoted it. So anyway, those are some scriptures. But now I want to share these verses with you in Hebrews chapter 9. And I tell you, this is phenomenal. And I wished I had time. It would take me literally a couple of hours to teach this the way I should. So I would like to encourage you to read Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10. And if you take the book of Hebrews as a whole, it's bringing people who were in the Jewish traditions and the legalism, and it's bringing them into the new covenant, and it is countering a lot of legalistic performance-based mentality. This is the reason that the book of Hebrews is not most people's favorite book because it's just so contrary to everything we've been taught. They don't relate to it. They mm -hmm. don't understand it, and so they just shove it aside. But in Hebrews chapter 9, specifically, he is contrasting the way sins were dealt with under the Old Testament with the way they were dealt with under the New Testament. And he says specifically that the Old Testament sacrifices had to be offered every time you committed a sin. You had to bring a sacrifice, and then there was one day out of the year where you had a day of atonement and you offered a sacrifice to cover all of the sins that you had missed, the ones that you didn't even know about, the ones that you didn't repent of. So there was just constant sacrifices. And sad to say, most Christians today still believe that that's true, that that's every true. time they sin, they lose their relationship mm -hmm. either totally or partially, and they've got to get that sin under the blood and back into relationship with God. And that is not what the Word teaches. So listen to what it says here in Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 12, again, it's contrasting the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. And it says in verse 12, it says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And again, if you were to study this in context, the emphasis is on once. One time Jesus paid for our sins and dealt with sins once and for all. You know, I, I can hear people right now saying, God can't forgive a sin before you commit it. 
But you better pray he can forgive a sin before you commit it because he only died for our sins one time 2,000 years ago. Jesus is not dying for our sins. Did you know when Jesus died, your and my sins were all future tense? Jesus forgave the sin of the entire human race and not only up until the time that he came, but to deal with all the time in the future. Sin has been dealt with. Now, this does not mean that everybody's saved. Sins have had the price paid, but you have to receive that salvation. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 2, that we have access into this grace through faith. And so faith is how you access it. It says Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, you're saved by grace through faith. You aren't saved by grace alone, and you aren't saved by faith alone. You're saved by grace, that's God's part, through faith. So Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world and even future ten sins, but that does not mean that every person's sins are wiped out and forgiven because you have to receive it. If you don't receive it, well, then you will have to answer for every one of those sins that you've committed. But this says that he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Praise what God. part of eternal redemption do you not understand? <laughs> I mean, that's pretty clear. That is great news, Andrew. <laughs> but you know, the average person really believes that you have momentary redemption until the next time you sin. Mm -hmm. I've actually heard people before say that if you are driving down the road and if you had just committed some sin, if you'd committed adultery, and if you were driving down the road and if you had a car wreck and you died and you didn't have time to repent and mm -hmm. ask forgiveness, you'd go to hell. Even if you'd been serving the Lord for 40, 50 years or whatever, if you had an unconfessed sin in your life, you would die and go to hell. You know, that's bondage. That's tough. Because in James chapter 2, verse 10, it says if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. You know, I have lived a holier life relative to other people. Now, in God's sight, I would never say this, but I'm talking about relative to people. I have, I'm, I'll be turning 69 soon. I have never said a word of profanity. I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never tasted coffee. <laughs> and I know some people are thinking, coffee? Well, there's nothing wrong with coffee. I'm not saying there is. You got scripture that says you can drink coffee. It says in Mark chapter 16, verse 18, you can drink any deadly thing and it shall not harm you, amen. So I'm not against coffee. I'm just saying I've lived a separated life, but I have sinned. And if you keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. And so it's not like, you know, even though I might be a better sinner than somebody else, I've sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23, and the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. There isn't a hell number two or a hell number three. If you miss heaven by an inch, you miss it by a mile. I needed a savior. I needed to be saved. So somebody who says, well, if you're driving down the road and if you had just committed adultery and had a car wreck and didn't confess it, you'd go to hell. You can't tell me a person with unconfessed sin in their life would go to heaven. Well, let me ask you this. What would happen if you were going 56 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone and have a car wreck? Would you go to hell for that? Because the Bible says you're supposed to obey the laws of the land and you broke the law. Oh, no, I, I'd never believe that. Well, then see, you are categorizing sin and That's saying there true. are some sins that are acceptable and others that aren't acceptable. If they're little sins, if they're white sins, there is no such thing. Again, James chapter 2, verse 10, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. And so this says he obtained eternal redemption for us. People who believe that every time you sin that God rejects you, and you either are lost and you got to get born again again, which there is no such thing as born again, 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 the way that people live it. Or you may still retain your salvation, but God won't fellowship you with you, won't bless you. He won't use you if you have any sin in your life. I've heard people say God won't use a dirty vessel. God hadn't got any other kind of vessel to That's use. True. We're just in all different yes. levels of being disqualified. God's never had anybody qualified working for him yet. Amen. And if, you know, I know that there's people that are upset with what I'm saying because this is so contrary to our religious tradition. I'm sharing scripture with you. You have eternal redemption. One time he entered in. I don't know how you argue with this, but pe 
You know, most people don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. <laughs> They're going to believe it regardless of what the Bible says. But I'm telling you, it says he entered in once and obtained eternal redemption. Then look at this in verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Verse 12 says you get eternal redemption. Verse 15 says you have eternal inheritance, and yet the average Christian does not believe that it's eternal. They believe it's temporary until the next time you sin, and then you got to get that sin confessed and under the blood. And I wish I had time to go into all of these verses, but let me just pick a few. This is in the same chapter, Hebrews chapter 9. It says in verse 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often. Again, he's contrasting. Under the old covenant, every time you sinned, you had to have a sacrifice. But see, those things were only pictures. They weren't the real deal. And so the, since it wasn't really dealing with the deal, you had to have the picture painted over and over and over. But with Jesus, it's different. So it says in verse 25, Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place, with, uh, holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Mm -hmm. So this is, if you were to study the whole chapter five times in Hebrews chapter 9, it's contrasting that the Old Testament offered a sacrifice every time you sin, but in the New Testament, because we have something better than just a type and a shadow, we've got the actual Lamb of God. He took exactly. away all sin, and we have eternal redemption, eternal inheritance, one sacrifice once dealt with your sin once and for all. Amen. Man, that is awesome. If you can awesome. understand what I'm saying, this would radically change your relationship with God because probably the vast majority of people watching me right now, you don't doubt that God exists, and you don't doubt that God has power but what you do doubt is that God would use his power because you have a sin consciousness and feel like your sins are separating you. And even though you may have confessed everything you can think of, you just live with a sin consciousness. And then Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, you know, men are the ones that put the chapter and verse divisions in here. But the very next verse says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers therein too perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? There's a question mark there. If, if you could have had a sacrifice which could have really worked, and it wasn't just symbolic, but it was a real deal, it would have, they would have quit offering the sacrifices because it says the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sin. Now, of course, the Old Testament sacrifices couldn't do that, but the New Testament sacrifice of Jesus did, and this is just amazing. The Scripture is saying we should have no more conscience of sin. And yet the average Christian actually believes that sin consciousness is a good thing. It keeps you humble. Mm -hmm. It keeps you broken. Anyway, I could say a lot of things about that. Let me jump down to verse 9. I've just got a couple of more verses I've got to share with you. It's too good not to share. But in verse 9 it says, Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified. The word sanctified means to, to perfect or to separate, make holy, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. How clear can you make it? The next verse says, And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. One sacrifice for sins forever. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever 
them that are sanctified. So verse 10 says you've been sanctified through the one offering of Jesus once and for all. And verse 14 says if you were sanctified, you've also been perfect, made perfect. People can't b receive this because they look in the mirror and they think this isn't mm -hmm. perfect. And they see wrinkles and zits and ugly. And <laughs> they think this isn't perfect. It's not talking about your body. And it's not talking about your soul, your mental, emotional part. But in your spirit, when you accept Jesus, your spirit's made perfect. Amen. Hebrews 12, 22 and 23 says this. It says, For you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 10, 14 says you were made perfect through that one offering once and for all. And this makes it clear. It was your spirit that is perfect. God is a spirit, John 4, 24. And if you understood this, God is looking at you in the spirit. Your spirit has been sanctified and perfected forever. God is not imputing sin to you. And I wish I had time to explain more. Maybe next week we'll get into this. But this is not saying that, well, whoopee, I can go live in sin. <laughs> Well, if you do, Satan's going to eat your lunch and pop the bag. <laughs> but God won't rebel at you. He forgave you of all of that sin, but there's still consequences to that sin and you should still live holy, not in order to receive God's love, but because you're so thankful for the love He's already given you. So I know I ran through this awesome. quickly and I know that there's bound to be a million questions. I'll answer some, but uh, I'd like to encourage you to get some materials I've got entitled Spirit, Soul, and Body. I've got a book on that, CDs, DVDs, and just a lot of teaching on this. That was awesome, Andrew. Do you know, I remember being taught that, that you had to confess something, you know, or just like what you were describing, that you wouldn't go to heaven. You know, that's not peaceful. That is not a place to live. Well, the Bible says that being justified by faith, we have peace with God. The only way Amen. you'll ever have peace is if you are justified putting faith in what Jesus did, not yes. in your performance. Oh, I crazy. can tell you that somebody is going to ask about 1 John 1, 9. They probably will. Have you seen that? I have not seen it yet. Well, Do I'm you want surprised. to answer it? Well, no, because it takes me too long. <laughs> I want to take some other answers. But let me just say that I've got a teaching entitled Eternal Redemption that will answer that. It's in my Redemption album. I've just got an album titled Redemption. And then I've got Spirit, Soul, and Body, which is what I call my identity in Christ. And those will go into that detail. But that would be a logical question. Yeah, it might come up. So um, I just want to remind everybody, if you do have a question, to go ahead and um, submit your question on chat or through Facebook, or you can send it with your cell phone. You can message it to 954 800 AWMI. And as Andrew mentioned, he went through his notes really fast. There are seven pages here. And if you would like those notes, go ahead to awmi.net slash Bible study and sign up and we'll get those notes out to you within the week. So Andrew, you have got a lot of questions coming in here. This is a great topic and people are really wondering about some things. Uh, and so Jean from Facebook says, I know in my head I am forgiven, but how does it get down into my heart? And that's a great question. And you know, uh, in Proverbs chapter three, I would have to look these verses up, but I think it's Proverbs 3, 3. It's in the first part of Proverbs 3. It says, write these things upon the table of your heart. And if you put that together with Psalms, I believe it's chapter 45. Again, I'd have to look this up, but uh, it says, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. So you know how you write something on your heart? You begin to say it. That's good. You start speaking it. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And what was his name? Uh, this was, uh, actually I think it was Joan. Oh, Jean. okay. But Jean. Jean. But see, Jean, if you are, if you see it, but you're having trouble grabbing hold of it, it's because you've had it written on your heart by the hurt things you've heard your whole life and it's been written on your heart and you've got to rewrite it and the way you rewrite it is by speaking it. When the Lord first started showing some of these truths to me, I was in a denomination that taught the exact opposite of this. You were a worm and I admit that apart from Jesus, I am nothing. But they didn't teach that there was part of you that was saved. It was all going to take place in heaven. And when I started seeing that I was the righteousness of God and that I was forgiven and that I was sanctified and perfected, 
Nobody else was saying. So you know what I did? I stood in front of a mirror and I looked myself eyeball to eyeball and I would just preach to myself, you are the righteousness of God. And the first time I ever said that, I honestly was afraid God was going to strike me dead <laughs> because I'd been taught that all, there's none righteous. No, not one. Mm -hmm. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And that's all true if you were talking about just your carnal part. But in the spirit, you are a new creature and in the spirit, you are new. So I used to just stand in front of a mirror and I spoke it. And the first time, all the hair on the back of my mm -hmm. neck stood up out of fear, but I just kept speaking it and mm -hmm. writing it on my heart. And so, uh, Gene, that's how you do it. You're just going to have to take these truths. Again, these notes, I've got hundreds of scriptures in here that I did not refer to. And if you were to take these and study them mm -hmm. and just start speaking these things, and saying, I am the righteousness of Amen. God. God does love me. God's not holding my sins against me. All of my sins are forgiven, past, present, and even future sins. I'm sanctified. I'm perfected forever. And you start speaking those things to you, after a while, it'll go to impact yes, in you. And you'll believe it. Yep. Amen. That's a great answer, Andrew. Okay, Julia from chat says, what happens to the spirit of an unbeliever? I get this question many times while teaching on spirit, soul, and body, and I'm not sure of the answer. Well, a person who's not born again, they have a spirit that is separated from God. This is the reason that Jesus said you must be born again, because we were all born with a spirit that was dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, I won't take time to read it, but it says we were by nature the children of wrath. We were separated from God. We had a spirit that was separated from God. And unless a person gets born again, well, then that dead spirit, dead doesn't mean that it's not functional and it doesn't exist. It means separation. It's separated from God. And until that spirit gets born again and in union with God, if a person was to die like that, they would go directly to hell. Mm. So a person with a spirit that has not been born again cannot relate to God because, again, John 4, 24 says God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not just a suggestion or this is the best results. You have to do it. If you aren't born again, you cannot have a relationship with God until you get a brand new spirit. God is a spirit and you have to relate to him spirit to spirit. Oh, that's, that's a great answer, Andrew. So I think we've got that question. It's not as direct as you were saying, but Debs on chat says, if we are already forgiven, why and how should we repent? Well, that's 1 John 1, 9. Mm -hmm. And that verse says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Did you know that that, the typical interpretation of that is that if you don't confess your sin, it's not forgiven. Let me just ask you, how would you live that out? Does this mean that you've got to have every sin confessed? Which is, if you interpret it that way, that's what that means. Did you know Romans 14, 23 says, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. If you're going to say that you can't have any unconfessed sin in your life, well then, anytime you aren't in faith, Anytime you have fear, anytime you worry, anytime you don't cast your care over on the Lord, anytime you aren't just walking and raising from the dead power, you're living in sin. If I really believed that any unconfessed sin meant that you were separated from God, then the moment you got born again, I'd just kill you. <laughs> I might go to hell, but that's the only way you'd ever get to heaven is for me to just kill you the moment you get born again. But you know, it says in Ephesians 1.13, it says that once you trusted in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Your spirit is a part that was born again. That's what I spent all last week talking about. Ephesians 4.24, you were created in righteousness and truly holy. So you were created, born again, completely pure, brand new. And the moment you were born again, Ephesians 1.13 says you were sealed. You were vacuum packed. And so what happens is when a Christian commits sin, your spirit is sealed. And that sin will enter into your body and it can give Satan an inroad for you being put in jail, for you getting into a fight. It'll give Satan an inroad into you. You could get sick and things like that. And it will enter into your soul and it will affect the way you feel and the way you think but it can't penetrate the seal around your spirit and your spirit retains that righteousness and holiness that was created in. So all of this back to 1 John 1, 9. Well, then why confess your sins? 
Because even though your spirit is sealed and your eternal salvation is, is fine, you have given Satan an inroad into your life. Romans 6.16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So if I yield myself to Satan through yielding to his sin, I gave him access to my body and to my soul. I could have sickness. I could have poverty. I could have depression. I could have fear. I could have worry because I'm living in sin. And if you find yourself in that situation, what do you do? You confess it and you ask for forgiveness. Not eternal forgiveness because, again, you've been forgiven of all sins. You have eternal redemption. And so you don't have to ask forgiveness in the sense that it's going to affect your relationship with God or your eternal destiny, but you have just given Satan a legal right to dominate you. How do you get him out? You confess it. And in 1 John 1, 9, the word that was translated confess there, it's the Greek word homo legeos. And the word homo, it means one or same. That's the reason you talk about a homosexual. It's the same sex. So homo means one and logos is a word, spoken word. And so it means that you are saying the same thing. So if you confess and say, God, you were right. I was wrong. And you now agree and say the same thing that God says. You have just turned your back on the devil. You have shut that door that you opened to the devil and now that forgiveness that's in your spirit spills out through your soul and through your body and he now has no longer a legal right to you. So there's been times, Karen, that I've actually had people come for prayer and God showed me that they had unforgiveness and bitterness and Satan was using this. It was like a legal wow. access. An inroad. I actually had a woman one time who had uh, arthritis and she was on a walker and it took her 10 minutes to walk 10 feet uh, with mm -hmm. this walker and I prayed with her and she was healed and put the uh, walker over her head and started walking back and forth and running and it was awesome. But the next night she came back on the walker again mm -hmm. and she was all stoved up. And she says, I don't know what happened, but by the time I got to my car, I had all of this pain back. And I said, well, we rebuke the devil, but you've got some inroad into your life that allows him access. And I said, let's pray. And anyway, long story, but I prayed. And within seconds, the Lord showed me that she had hatred. She had unforgiveness in her heart oh, towards wow. somebody. So I just mentioned this to her and she started crying. And this was back... Mm. 30 or 40 years ago and 30 or 40 years before that. So this is 80 years ago. This woman, uh, her and her boyfriend, he said, if you really love me, you'd have sex with me before we get married. And so she went ahead and had sex with him and she got pregnant and then he left. Mm -hmm. And that's back before, you know, you could oh, get an yeah. abortion and it was a stigmatism on it. And so this woman, uh, her whole life was ruined and she raised this child by herself and she had hated this man for like 40 years. Mm. And as soon as I said, you got unforgiveness, she immediately knew who it was. And, and I said, right now there's an anointing to forgive. And I just prayed with her and she started forgiving and she prayed and forgave this man and the bitterness that she had held against him for all of those years. And I said, now we can pray. And she says, you don't need to. And she put her walker <gasps> over her head and she walked off free. and she was free. Oh, and I was there for another three or four nights and she never had another problem. So see, she was forgiven. God yes. had forgiven her, but she gave Satan a legal inroad. So mm -hmm. how do you stop that? You repent and say, God, I'm sorry. And you forgive and you start saying the same thing God says. That's, That's what First so John 1, 9 is about. Do you know a lot of people don't really see those emotions or bitterness uh, in the category of sin. That really clarifies oh, things absolutely. for people. That's awesome, Andrew. Okay, we've got a lot of questions coming in. These are so good. So I've got Ashley from Facebook. And Ashley says, if you act on the Word of God and you ask Jesus to save you, is that heart faith or Bible faith? And she goes on to say, how do you know you have real faith versus head faith? I'm not sure what she means by heart faith or Bible faith. To me, heart faith is Bible faith. Exactly. And Bible faith is heart faith. Mm -hmm. I mean... There are people that will say they believe God, but James chapter 2 says, you say you have faith. Will you show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, true faith. Faith is all it takes to receive from God. But if it's true faith, it'll never be alone. 
it'll always have actions with it. Mm -hmm. And so good. one of the ways you can tell whether you've really put your faith in the Lord is by the actions that you have. There will be corresponding actions. Now, it's careful here that you don't think that, all right, I'm safe, so now I'll never make another mistake mm -hmm. because you will yeah. sin and come short of what God wants you to be even after you're a born-again believer. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but a person who says they are trusting in the Lord and I'm saved, and yet there is zero evidence of it in your life, I would doubt very seriously whether it was true Bible faith because it does produce a change. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, the scripture there says that we have a witness in ourself and we know that we have passed from death unto life. When you truly get born again, there's a change that takes place in your heart. Now, you may still sin because a lot, I hadn't got time to explain this, but a lot of religion actually empowers sin. It actually makes you sin conscious and you fail constantly. And there are some people who are true believers that just constantly fail in an area because they don't understand how much God loves them. They're under condemnation. But if you are truly born again, you will feel miserable when you sin versus before you got born again, you'd go out and sin and no big deal. Everybody does it. And, the, and if you feel condemned and like you're such a failure, that's probably a pretty good indication that God did change your heart. You may not be acting it out the way you should because you don't have the truth. Uh, John, Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And if you aren't under the real truth of the word of God, you could still be failing. But if you are failing, you are miserable about it. You know God changed your heart and you don't want to live that way. So a person who is just living in sin with no conscience, I would say you aren't born again. A person who is living in sin that is stricken over, that may be an indication that you're truly born again, but it basically just comes about down to, did you really make Jesus your mm -hmm. Lord? Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You know, we've got people on our phones right now that if some of you are listening to me and you're saying, well, man, I'm not sure I've done that. Uh, I, I believe that Jesus exists. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 19, you believe that there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. <laughs> That's one of the most sarcastic statements in the Bible. <laughs> you believe that there's one God, all you've done is what the devil's done. That's not salvation. But the next verse goes on to say that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So if you aren't sure and if you want someone just to help you and pray with you, we've got people standing by right now at 719-635-1111. And these people can pray with you and help you to make sure that you're born again. And if you have any questions, they can uh, give you materials. Matter of fact, I've got a free book that we give out to all of the people who call in for salvation. It's entitled The New You Slash Holy Spirit. And if you got born again, call and pray with someone. We'll be glad to send that to you. So it's 719-635-1111. That's great, Andrew. Thank you. Carrie from Facebook says, please answer this. What does Jesus mean when he says, I never knew you when people will say to him, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons? He means I never knew you. <laughs> See what the problem is, people think, but they were casting out demons. No, they weren't. They were saying they were doing it. Matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, that's from Matthew is yes. where that is. 7, 21 through 20. And if you look at it in Luke's account, I believe it's Luke chapter 6, mm -hmm. over there you see that they said that they cast out devils. They said that they did these things, but they didn't, but they do, didn't it. do it. And people will think, well, how would somebody say that? I've talked to people on that very verse, and I've said, you aren't filled with the Holy Spirit. You aren't doing the miracles. It says that if you are a believer, you'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And they said, oh, I do that. And I said, when did you ever lay hands on somebody? 
And they said, we prayed for him at church and asked God to guide the surgeon's hand, and then they got mm -hmm. healed. And so they say that they are healing the sick. I said, when did you ever cast out devils? Well, we prayed for a person and sent them to the psychiatrist, and they mm -hmm. gave them medicine, and their uh, you know moods yes. have been altered. And they are actually believing that they're oh, casting wow. out devils and healing the sick by sending people to the doctor and sending them to the That sounds like a stretch. <laughs> well, it is. and But there are going to be people that are deceived, say, but God, I did all of these things. No, they didn't. They're going to be saying it, but they didn't do mm. what he said. And in Luke, it makes it very clear. He says, why do you say unto me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? They were not truly doing it. They were just going through the motions. Boy, that's a great answer. All right, Mr. Ron on chat says, if your spirit is saved, what about your soul? Your soul is your emotions, your personality part, your mind, will, and emotions. There's more to it than that. Your conscience is a part. But your matter of fact, there's only twice in Scripture that I'm aware of that it talks about soul salvation. One is in the book of Daniel, he that winneth souls is wise. And then in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, I think it's one of the last verses of Hebrews chapter 11, it says that you believe to the saving of the soul. When you get born again, your soul's not saved. It's your spirit that's saved. When your soul gets saved is when, say, for instance, you're depressed and all of a sudden you start studying the Word and you cry out to God and He touches you and all of a sudden, man, the joy of the Lord comes on you and you overcome this depression or you overcome the fear. That's soul salvation and that's something that ebbs and flows and comes and goes and stuff. But your spirit salvation is when you get born again. And the moment you get born again, that spirit is sealed with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's sanctified, perfected forever, and it never changes. But your soul needs to be saved all of the time. Every time you get into fear, anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, whatever, you need to have your soul saved. But that's not talking about saved in the sense of whether you're going to hell or not. The word saved just means healthy, whole, delivered, things like that, and your soul gets saved every time you submit your emotions to the Word of God instead of just going by how you feel. That's good, Andrew. So we've got a question coming in from somebody that's watching you on GEB, and it's based on Hebrews 10, 26, and they say, if we willfully sin after we receive the knowledge of truth, there is no, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Will you please explain, and this person says this is so new. This is a very good question, and it's logical, but let me point out that I was dealing with Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 14, and that's where it says you should have no more conscience of sin. You're sanctified once for all. You are, if you're sanctified, you're also perfected. And then it goes on through some verses here and says that now we can enter boldly into the holy place without any fear of sin and no uh, sin consciousness. But then it says, if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a f certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. I, again, for time's sake, I encourage you to please get my materials. It'll go into more detail. But let me point out some things in this very passage that you're talking about. It says in verse 28, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. How much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. If I had more time, I think I could explain this better. But this isn't talking about just a sin that came because of failure you know, somebody said something and before you knew it, you just flew off the handle and you said something or things like this. This is talking about a person that despised Moses' law. And it says down here, people who have done despite under the spirit of grace. The word despite means hatred, intent to hurt. This isn't talking about just a sin of the flesh, a weakness of the flesh. This is talking about a total rejection, turning on the Lord and it also says that you have trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. Let me ask you, I know that there's people watching this program and you have sinned. You knew that you were wrong. You know you shouldn't have been, you know, watching something on the internet that you did, but you did it anyway. But did you count the blood of the covenant 
that had sanctified you in an unholy thing? Did you hate God and just, God, I want nothing to do with you? This isn't talking about a person that just sins through weakness and failure. This is talking about a person who renounces their salvation. And this is going to bring up a whole bunch of... <laughs> you know, this is really not complicated, but what makes it hard is we've been taught the opposite yes. so much that I have to counter all of this other mm -hmm. teaching. If you just were a blank slate and I could write on you, there, it wouldn't be hard. But religion uh, comes along and they say, well... You know, you lose your salvation when you sin and things. And, and they come along and say that every time you sin, you are separated from God and you're saved, lost, saved, lost, you're in and out. You can't lose your salvation. Not like you lose a pen. I lost it. Where did it go? I didn't <laughs> want to lose it, but I, it's not accidental. This is talking about a willful rejection, a total rejection of the Lord. And it is possible for a person who has been born again to reject the Lord. But if you do it, it's a one-time deal. And if you ever do that, you can never be born again. Mm. Let me share another scripture with you out of Hebrews chapter 6. Again, I've got a series on redemption and a specific teaching entitled Eternal Redemption that will deal with this in more detail. But it says in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified in themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. This is saying that Jesus can't die twice. You can't reapply the blood you can't be forgiven and then unforgiven and now forgiven again and stuff. It's only a one-time deal, but you can renounce it. And if you do renounce your faith in the Lord, you can never come back to repentance. But it puts five qualifications on it. You have to be enlightened, which again, I hadn't got time. I could show you that's talking about the Holy Spirit has to enlighten you. This can't be you're born again because your parents told you you right. need to be saved. You got to be drawn by God. And then it says you have tasted of the heavenly gift, which is talking about you were truly born again and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. This is talking about a person that went beyond just being born again and got spirit filled and have tasted the good word of God. This is a person who's beginning to mature. The word of God is working in their life and changing them and the powers of the world to come. This is talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues, miracles, you are flowing in the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's describing a mature person. If you are a mature person, you could renounce your faith. If you're immature, you can't. And even the apostle Paul said that he blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you never, have un you never have forgiveness. It's the unpardonable sin. And yet Paul said, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit, but I receive forgiveness because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. In other words, he wasn't mature enough. He wasn't born again yet. He didn't know what he was doing and God gave him grace. It's similar to when I was a kid, about five or six, I got mad and ran away. Said, I don't want to be a womack anymore. And I wasn't even out of eyesight of my house before I got to thinking, where am I going? <laughs> what am I going to eat? And I, I was sorry I had done it. And I intentionally got caught in a barbed wire fence so that my brother could catch me and bring me back Aww. home. And, you know, if they would have turned me over to the police, the police wouldn't have let me change my name and quit being a woman because I was five or six years old. But when you get to be 50 years old, the government will actually stand on your side and they will force you. They can force you to sever ties with your family. They can't have anything to do with you because you're considered an adult. You have to know what you're doing. And God does not hold this, you know, rejecting your salvation against you if you're an immature Christian. And one of the ways you can tell, somebody says, but I, I feel like I was mature and yet I rejected the Lord and I feel so terrible about it. Well, if you feel terrible about it, then you have, weren't considered mature yet because it says in Romans chapter 1 that when you don't like to retain God in your mind, He turns you over to a reprobate mind. He takes mm -hmm. all conviction away. A person who is mature enough to have rejecting the Lord imputed unto them is a person that knows they're going to hell and they're glad. They, are, they do despite unto the Spirit of grace. They hate God. They are in rebellion mm -hmm. towards God. And if something like that happens, they can never be born again. 
Well, Andrew, this is something that people have questions on and you are really clearing up some things and I can tell by the questions that this is new to a lot of people. So I just want to remind you, if you do have questions or you want more information, call our helpline, as Andrew mentioned, 719-635-1111. And we do have people there to answer questions and to pray with you. This is, this is really awesome, Andrew. Well, I know it sure rocked my boat when I learned this. I can imagine how other people are being affected. It's really good. I can tell that uh, people are having some interesting questions come up here. Fred says, what does it mean to have no sin consciousness and what is the line of thought to receive it? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> I got a lot of teaching on that. But let me just say that if you enter into the presence of the Lord and if you come and you say, oh God, we come before you so humbly. God, we're unworthy. Lord, we don't deserve any of your goodness. I know that that's sin consciousness. Instead of coming and talking about how sorry you are, if you feel sorry, if you've lived a bad life, mm -hmm. come and talk about how awesome God is to love somebody as sorry as you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise Him instead. You know, if I was in your home, Karen, and let's say that you had a five-year-old kid, and if this kid came into the, to the kitchen and said, Mom, I know I didn't make my bed. I know I didn't carry out the trash. I know I haven't been what I should be, but please, could I have something to eat? I know I don't deserve it. I, and then they fell on the floor and got to worshiping <laughs> you, and please forgive me. I'd say you are a bad parent, that you had That's made true. this kid feel so unworthy that yeah. he couldn't get something to eat. Mm -hmm. See, they don't do that. They just come in boldly without a sin consciousness, even though they sin they come in and you go ahead and feed them even though they don't deserve it. And it's the same thing. We don't deserve the blessing of God, but still we should be so appreciative of Jesus that we can come boldly, Hebrews 4, 16, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy, find mercy and, and help in the time of trouble, not when everything's going good, but when everything's wrong. You should still have boldness awesome. to come in. So if you are constantly coming before the Lord, oh God, I'm so unworthy, I know I don't deserve it, you are sin conscious. Mm -hmm. And the way you get out of that is by renewing your mind through the Word of God. That's so good. We are really close to time um, being out here. So I think we have time for one or two more questions. Okay. And so Tammy from Facebook says, Andrew, I walked away from God for five years and I know I was born again. In that time I was away, I'm told I still was saved. How can this be? I was living in sin as if I never got saved. Well, first of all, Tammy, I'd say that because you are even asking this question, because you're watching a program where we're talking about the Lord, it shows that God did not impute that sin unto yeah. you, and you still have a desire for God. You couldn't do that if God wasn't drawing you. And you say, how could I do that? It's because your spirit was sealed, but you weren't walking in the spirit. You were walking in your flesh. You were living by your emotions. You were indul indulging your lust, you may have been offended and hurt and bitter and all of these other things, but the, all of that stuff is in your body and in your soulish, mental, emotional realm. Your spirit never loses its right standing with God. It's as saved and perfected right now as it was the moment you got born again, and it's as saved as it's ever going to be in the future. Your spirit doesn't fluctuate. It's your emotions and your mental part that change. We're out of time. We oh, got less wow. than a minute, but that went so fast. I know, but it was good. And I again, I'd like to say that I have a lot of material on this. If you would like to call our help line, mm -hmm. it's seven one nine six three five eleven eleven, and we have people there on the phones that will answer you. We've also got people on chat that will chat with you, whatever that means. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh, Karen and I are chatting the way I look at it. But if you want to get online and chat, there's people that will do that. And also, we'd like to remind you that, again, next week we're going to be doing this again. Again, with GEB, we're on their network, and uh, next week will be our last week to be doing that. But thank you so much for joining us, and thank, thank you for hosting, Karen. Thank You're you, a blessing. Andrew. So thank you for joining us. Remember that we do this every Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Time or 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Come and join us for our live Tuesday night Bible study.